Hello, my friends. It is I, Coach Powers, as they call me these days. Uh, I'm going to dive right in, answering some Benzo comments and questions and criticism that I've that I've received. And uh, so the first one is, well, I'm not going to say who it comes from, but they ask, Coach Powers, where the hell have you been? It's a great question. <clears throat> Uh, the short answer is I've been dealing with some health stuff. I got severe allergies uh, probably about a m- couple months ago. It really started, which is kind of new to me. And the allergies uh, just wreaked havoc. And it started with post-nasal drip, which led to full bronchitis, which led to a chest infection, uh, which led to insomnia because I was sitting, sleeping, uh, sitting up in a recliner trying to because if I laid down, I would have a lot of breathing problems. And of course, you know, going through COVID and everything, this did not do well for my mental health. I was constantly wondering, did I have COVID? I was seeing people around me get COVID. Uh, I've actually know someone who died from COVID now. You know, I had several friends and family that got uh, that got got COVID because I'm here in Florida, where you know, apparently, we don't uh, we don't do it right here. <laughs> we uh, we do it our way which is we don't wear a mask and to hell with social distancing, apparently, you know, it's all a hoax or something. So as you see, the numbers in Florida, the COVID numbers are skyrocketing right now uh, and have been. It's embarrassing. And uh, anyway, yeah, I created a bunch of stress and anxiety in me. You know, I was constantly worrying, is, is this allergies? And it got so bad that I thought this couldn't be allergies. Finally, I woke up one day gasping for air, ended up going to the emergency room. And they said, yeah, I think you have allergies. They didn't give me a COVID test. They did the, they took a temperature. They didn't have a fever. That's pretty much all they did. Like, breathing problems? Well, let's do an x-ray. Eh, nope. Nothing we can really see. Not much anyway. Yeah, it's probably allergies, you know. Did some breathing treatments, came home, slept another couple weeks in a recliner. Anyway, I'm trying to, let me try to get to the point. Insomnia set in and oh, just wrecked me. And so I'm still dealing with a little bit of that. And on top of that, it's been raining every day here in Florida. I mean, it's so tropical here. And so uh, it, it's been tough to get outside. I like to do my videos outside and sit in nature and do some of these. And every time I would set up, you know, it'd be sunny and nice out, all uh, ungodly hot, but sunny and nice at least. And then, you know, five minutes later, it's a thunderstorm. It's downpouring. <clears throat> so um, I'm trying not to cough too because I still got a little cough little bit of a allergy stuff that I'm dealing with. So anyway, yeah, I've been wrecked up with this insomnia and bronchitis, and it's been a miserable period for me. And top of everything going on with COVID, you know, just worrying about the state of things, the state of the country. You know, we've got this uh, almost a civil war brewing, it seems like. We've got racism running mock. People want to defund the police. People hate Trump. People love Trump. Uh, pedophile rings. I mean, it's it's madness. It's like we're watching a Stephen King novel unfold before our eyes, you know. And at some point, I think some of the best things we can do is just unplug and get the hell off it. You know, get off the, get offline, get off Facebook, get off the media, watch some comedies or something, and just try to remember that that's sort of not the real world. You know, that's real stuff happening out there. But I mean, seeing it every day, it just feels like it's looming over us, right? You got a disease with COVID that 99, they say 99% of people recover from, but but hell, watching the news and the way things are, I mean, it's so scary. It, it feels like 1% people get better. I mean, we're avoiding this stuff like the plague, some of us anyway. I mean, I, I know I've been trying to. Uh, so yeah, it's just been, it's been a maddening time. And I got some new videos coming out. I, I just came to the point where uh, maybe I don't, be, I can't put myself in it, but I'll try to entertain you guys other ways with different visuals or whatever. But the content's what's important, and I want to re- release some stuff on uh, mental health and COVID, dealing with mental, you know, mental illness during COVID, dealing with tapering and all these crazy things that are going on. So that will be coming out soon. So I guess I answered another question within that first question. So how have I? Where have? Where the hell have I been? I've been here. I've just been not sleeping and uh, dealing with bronchitis and nonsense. So. Hopefully I'm coming out the other end and I've got new content coming out for you guys because uh, I've got a lot of requests for that. So I definitely want to do that. Let's see. Next question. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, did benzos destroy my heart? I have palpitations daily two years out. 
<clears throat> I released a whole video on this topic. Um, so if, if you're someone that's wanting to know a bigger, a deeper answer to this, uh, I've got a video somewhere uh, on the topic. Um, heart palpitations stayed with me for a while. I mean, and with people who have anxiety or stress or panic or PTSD or even depression, heart palpitations, heart flutters, um, you know, heart rate speeding up or slowing down or having these weird feelings, that's pretty common. Uh, and actually really common. I mean, very, very common. And you have to keep reminding yourself that because otherwise you'll, it'll spook you. You know, you'll start to think you have a major heart problem or something and, you know, it, it's all downhill after that point, right? So, yeah, two years out, that's, you know, that could be for a lot of reasons. I mean, obviously benzo-related, uh, but also it could just be that you're dealing with some persisting anxiety, panic, depression, stress, you know. It could be diet. It could be caffeine. It could be your job. I mean, it, there's so many factors that go into play on top of the benzo wreckage that we're left with, that which we do heal from. I know uh, maybe some of you are listening to this and go, what? what, what, what? How long does this all last? He's like, well, no, we, we do get better. Believe me, we do get better. But, you know, it, it, Benzos leaves us in a sensitive kind of wrecked state for a little bit afterwards. We have to rebuild ourselves. I mean, I always talk about John Lennon talked about getting off drugs and how, how it destroyed him and how he had, had to literally, it felt like he was literally rebuilding himself from the floor up, you know, from the ground up. I think that's, it always resonated well with me. It does feel like that. I mean... I had an old cat. My brother had an old cat, not me. My brother, we lived together and he had a cat and uh, named Charlie. It was this orange cat. And literally, the cat would jump if a butterfly flew next to it. I mean, and uh, he was just startled by everything, you know. <laughs> and I feel like coming off these uh, benzos, you know, we're almost like that. Our nervous system is left at a state that it's like, oh, my God, a butterfly. You know, uh, I remember um, having a panic attack after I came off while I was laughing. You know, I was laughing. I was watching a movie, and I actually had a moment where I was laughing. I was like, oh, I feel pretty good for a second. I haven't... And you know when you laugh, how you get that high feeling? It's like an endorphin rush or something. You know, your eyes get blurry. And I would get that, and it would, oh, and it made me scared. I was like, oh, my God, I, what the hell is this? I can't laugh anymore. You know, I'm broken. And I just think we're left so sensitive that the nervous system, it's just, it's startling, you know? It has to, like, rebuild itself, for lack of a better analogy there. So uh, the palpitations will eventually subside. I recommend exercise, walking a lot. 30 minutes a day is would be great. An hour a day would be great, not only f for the palpitations, but it would give you confidence in your heart and your cholesterol and, you know, cardio cardiovascular health. And uh, does a, a tremendous job. Walking does a tremendous job. You know, exercise does a tremendous job at fighting depression, anxiety, and, and helping neurological repairment. So I would do those things. And also look in the pots. Um, pots is something else that I didn't even realize I had until much later. Um, I, I'll get into pots later. I want to ramble on this. But uh, Google search pots. And that goes away too before you, you know, freak out. Uh, what else here? Um, come on, Dave, tell the truth. Do people really heal? Well, look, I'm, I'm eight years off now and I really heal, but I'll tell you every year, I feel like I'm still healing in a weird way. And maybe not healing is the right word from benzos completely, but I'm, I'm rebuilding and getting stronger every year. I should say it that way. But I've always had it, you know, I realized later I always had some anxiety or some mood disorder or some depression, things like that it runs in my family. But I remember I mean, just more recently, I was in, I think, Publix, and I was walking around, and sometimes I get, especially if I don't go grocery shopping very often, or if I'm not, you know, uh, being very social, because I work a lot out of the house, I'm an artist, and I write, and I do film, and, uh, you know, uh, cinematography and things, and so if I'm not out around people a lot, especially during a pandemic, which I'm not, when you go into a place like that, sometimes if you have anxiety, you know, it, it creeps up on you, and you'll be, a, you'll have to go get something in the back of the store, let's say, where the meat, you know, uh, aisle is, and you'll just be like, oh, God, I got to go back there. I hope this doesn't bother me. I hope I don't get a little anxious. Or you start looking at that exit, you know, how far is that exit? 50 feet, 100 feet, you know? And it's it's crazy that even years off of this stuff, I still dealt with that, you know, uh, especially within Walmart or big stores like that. Or if I was in a, you know, big, big crowd with a lot of people, you know, you get a little claustrophobic. And, and it's hard to tell if that's like benzo related or that's just part of who I was anyway. You know, that's just my constitution, so to speak. But I was uh, in public the other day and I, I was walking around shopping. I was like, huh, I didn't even, I go, wow, I've been doing this for a while. And I don't even think about this anymore. 
you know, I drove two hours out of town to, to, uh, to film something and didn't think about the drive, you know, you just, I think the best progress is when you just are doing you and focusing on what you should be doing, getting out of your head, getting away from the rumination. And then you just, you look back one day and you go, oh, wow, look, I'm doing this now. You know, I, I, it's almost like an alcoholic who counts every minute, every day, every, you know, he can tell you five years later, I'm a 4,192 minutes off alcohol, you know, that to that person, that alcohol has such an importance in their life, such a, it's such a powerful thing that every minute they're still consumed and it becomes very obsessive, very, you know, OCD, you're ruminating on, ruminating on it constantly. And, and the best place you are is when someone goes, Hey, when did you quit drinking? And you go, I'm, I think two, 10 years ago. I don't even know. And now you're in a good place. You know, and I think benzo withdrawal is like that a lot. Actually, it's hard because we're so obsessing over everything because we feel so damn horrible. It seems like it's never going to end. We're surrounded by horror stories. It seems like every, every other week we have a new symptom that's emerging that we have to, to go, what the hell is this now? You know, but after a while, it all becomes old and tiring and you've seen every symptom and you, you know, you start getting wise to it. And I think at that point, you're starting to pull away from the, the rumination and the OCD or getting a little headway. And at that point, you, you want to build some momentum and just break away from it, you know, get off uh, toxic forums or get away from toxic people, get away from the ruminating and, and just start going, okay, this is the new normal for now, for now is the key phrase. And now I'm just going to focus on what I need to do. I got a, I got a day here. You know, even when you're really bad in a wave, you got a day, there's things that you can do. Even if it's small victories throughout the day, you go, I'm going to get up, I'm going to do the dishes and then maybe I'll lay down and then maybe later I'll get up and I'll do some laundry and I'll lay down and then I'm going to walk to the mailbox three times today. It's simple, you know, somebody listened to this who didn't go through Benzo would go, what the hell are you talking about? Walking to the mailbox. That's, that's an accomplishment. Yes, it damn sure can be. And it's a damn good therapy too, by the way. Um, so now I'm just rambling. What, what was my point? Oh, Dave, tell the truth. Do people really heal? Yeah, they do. I've, I've worked with hundreds of people now and I've maybe a thousand or more people now online. And, and I can't even tell you countless. And I know my experiences, which are anecdotal. So to be fair, you know, I can't say what worked for me is guaranteed to work for everybody, but it did work for me. I can talk about friends and family I've seen come off it and, and how these things worked for them. I could talk about clients, countless clients that I've seen repeatedly get better by doing the things that they needed to do and, and fighting hard and keeping their spirit up and being a, a true damn warrior. That's what you got to be, a true warrior. I can only give you my experiences and, uh, and tell you, yeah, most people heal, you know. Uh, so, but you got to have faith in it. You got to believe in it. You got to have a fierce, delirious faith that you, and a no retreat, no surrender attitude that just says, the hell with this, I'm going to get better. And Benzo can kiss my ass. Right, next, would you say obsessive thoughts are a symptom? Hell yes. I, I call it obsessive thought. I, I, I don't know if I coined this, but I certainly always have used this phrase, benzo-induced OCD. I just think it's, it should be part of the curriculum, benzo-induced OCD. Uh, it's no different than regular OCD. So if you're not familiar with OCD, go get familiar with it. I'll put out some content more on that. I've spoken some about it. And, you know, it's obsessive and compulsive. Uh, obsessing and you know you're having an, a, a res you're responding to some stimulus some trigger in an obsessive way so you're you feel terrible and all we do is we think oh my god this is never going to end will this ever end this is never going to end will this ever end we just ruminate we circle and circle we obsess over it we have you know we have a heart flutter we run to the internet we look up things we get on forums and we wash rinse repeat this every day in and out and, and it's, you know, and at some point you have to see it for what it is, this phantom enemy that's fighting us in, in almost in our mind, you know, because after you get away from the heart thing, it'll be something different. It'll be ringing in the air and you'll research that and then it'll be blurred vision. It'll be shaky vision. It'll be headaches. It'll be metallic taste. It'll be a lump in your throat. It'll be tension in your chest and you're having difficulty breathing. And oh, wait, now this month it's GI issues. Let's run and ruminate on that. And, you know. Uh, you'll just keep, it just keeps going, you know? I think you got to be safe. You have to, you know, educate yourself, figure out what's going on, figure out how to get better from it and what you can do to mitigate things. That's all healthy. After that, we have to get the hell 
uh, out of there. You know, we have to get the hell, we have to turn the page. We have to, you know, however you want to say it, we got to get out of that place. Um, so without going too long, because these are just, I want to get through these questions. Would you say obsessive thoughts are a symptom? Absolutely. It's a key symptom. It's 90% or more of my clients that I work with uh, as a benzo coach. This is what they go through. Ruminous, ruminating, waking up in the middle of the night, can't sleep, can't stop thinking about this. I, I have many clients that, uh, especially when we started, you know, the goal is to get them out of this zone, but they I would they would say, you know, I wake up and I ruminate. I get on my phone and I talk to people that are going through it and I read forums and I, I cry and I watch videos of people suffering. I mean, there's a reason why my videos, as good as some of you guys think they are, why they don't get the views uh, as some of these other people who get thousands of views. And, and if you look at the difference, a lot of these people, they're, they're just suffering. They're sitting there and they're suffering and, and we gravitate toward it because we're miserable, we're suffering, and we go, oh my God, this person's relating to me. Oh, look at this person, you know? And, and not to crap on them. I mean, they're doing what they can. They're trying to reach out. They're sharing information and good for them, you know? But I'm just saying we gravitate toward that misery loves company and when you're in you know a foxhole you're looking for others in a foxhole and it can become very negative it can become very negative um and it only perpetuates the ruminous the ruminating thoughts the obsessive thoughts the compulsive thoughts you know so yeah um yeah some of these i want to really get in deeper but i don't i don't want to run out of time here so uh, maybe I'll say some more. I, actually, I would definitely say a lot more on benzo-induced OCD. But to answer your question, would you say obsessive thoughts is a, a symptom? Absolutely. 100%. And, and you, can, you can get that under control to a degree anyway. I mean, it's, it's a lot of this stuff during <clears throat> benzo withdrawal is nothing but management. It's, it's pushing an elephant up the stairs, but it's worth it. You know, it's worth the, the hard work. Um. Next question, I feel so much guilt and shame because I have a family to take care of and I can't. That's a tough one too. I mean, for anyone. And I often say, I can only speak as a man, you know, as a man, when you have all these societal, <coughs> excuse me, um, influence, uh, conditioning, you know, you're supposed to be the breadwinner, you gotta be strong, you gotta be a provider, you gotta, you know, and then you can't work, you're finding yourself, or you're, you're struggling and you're, it's so debilitating debilitating it's so defeating it's so depressing and look this is for anyone i mean anyone who's working who can't work i mean even as if you're just a house uh, and i would say just a housewife but you're a housewife and you're at home you're taking care of the kids and you're running that ship and suddenly you can't do it the way you could before you can't handle this stuff you start to get depressed you start going oh my god and then you start thinking crazy thoughts you know is my husband's gonna leave me if you know i, I can't be intimate with him or i can't deal with the, the kids are getting miserable and then you start thinking about the time you've been suffering and oh god i'll look at all the life that i'm missing and, and the moments and it is so damn depressing it is so damn depressing and depression is the is the pervasive key culprit to all this suffering by the way as you're going through benzo it is it, it, we think it's the anxiety it's the panic and this and the cathesia even though cathesia is terrible but it's it's underlined by depression man it, depression is what st sets all of this in motion well you know actually it's the benzo of course but the then this depression then it's a uh, it's a uh, thousand of other symptoms that we in, in decorative branches that we get lost in um so there, there's tons of guilt and shame um, that you feel. And that's normal. The first step is realizing that's normal in this situation. You would feel like this in any situation where you couldn't do these things. But the thing you have to understand is treat yourself with a delicate hand and say, how would I feel if I had cancer? Would I be this hard on myself if I had cancer? Chances are, hopefully you wouldn't. A lot of us still would. We'd go, uh, you know, we, we'd still feel like that. I, I got to get to work. You got cancer. Chill out. You're going through therapy, you know, you're going through treatment, relax. Uh, but so at some level, there's, it's just par for the course, you know, look, you're going to feel that way, but don't let it rule you. The fact that you let it rule you or have that much power over you, that is now in our hands because we have to look at ourselves like someone who's fighting cancer. We're fighting a disease. We're doing all we can do. And if you really want to mitigate your guilt, start fighting hard. Get up, do the exercises, you know, the start out light, do the exposure stuff, work with your therapist, check your diet, make sure you're drinking lots of water, make sure you're sticking to that taper plan, don't go up in your dose, don't drop too fast, don't ruminate, don't, if you know damn well, sitting, getting up and spending six hours on a forum that's only going to make you nervous and more anxious the whole day, 
is bad for you, then start trying to pull away from it. That will, you know, then you can at least take some pride in, hey, I'm doing everything I can for my family and for my health and for everything. And the rest of it is you just got to get over the guilt and shame. Like I say, the only way I can equate it is to you're fighting cancer. You know, you'd be easy with yourself. It's okay. And also remember you're setting an example for your family, your friends, for your children. You know, you're setting an example. So you can say, hey, look, sometimes in life we get weak, we get knocked down, we can get debilitated. No one gets out of here alive. Everyone goes through something, a divorce, a death, a job, a disease, something, right? Terrible accident. So it's part of just good mental health, I guess you could say, of being human, to just learn how to accept this thing, these things as they come. Have a gentle hand with yourself. Love yourself as hard as it is in these moments. Love yourself. And pick up the pieces and keep going and keep trying and keep the faith. And at least at the end, you could say to your family, your friends, your husband, your wife, your kids, you could say, this is how it's done. Look at what I did. And they'll respect you. They'll say, damn, I saw... They may not know what you're going through because they can't unless they ever find themselves in that situation. And maybe someone, one of these people do. I mean, what, is that so hard to believe that someone you know could get addicted to benzos by following a doctor's orders and then find themselves in a hell of a place? And they look at you and say, man, I remember so-and-so, my friend, he went through this and he got better. And, and I remember what he did. Or they can reach out to you. You look like a damn you know, war hero to these people, you know? I mean, you really are a war hero when you beat this stuff. It's like, you know, only the benzo people really would give you the props. Uh, most of them anyway. Some of them are haters. They try to tear you down. Well, you, you didn't go through what I went through. I hear that so much with people. We got to stop doing that, guys. Everybody's burden everyone's suffering is different and who who, who we can't quantify suffering and, and measure it against other people anyway that's just bad everybody's suffering everybody's got their burden you know so yeah guilt and shame it's a bullshit byproduct of this crap ride run but uh you know you don't have to let it run your life i think you you got to practice self-love you really do and uh it might help to reach out to your family let them know you know if you're being someone who's trying to be tough and you're keeping it in and all they're seeing is the worst sides of you and the worst symptoms, it's not a bad idea to talk to them and say, hey, sit down for a second. Can I talk to you? I want you to know what I'm going through. And, you know, really tell them. And they go, oh, my God, you're going through that? And you're able to still do it? Wow. You know? Perspective is everything. It can really change things. So that's that's some advice. Um, what do benzo waves mean? Seems like evidence my brain is damaged. That's interesting, right? And this is where perspective and perception come into play so much. Uh, a benzo wave can look like, it's kind of like the half cup is half empty or is it half full analogy, right? So a benzo wave, it, it, that's just evidence my brain isn't healing. I say the opposite. I say, no, that's evidence your brain is healing. If you have diabetes, you, you can't just one day stop having diabetes for no reason. It doesn't just work that way. You can't go, well, I have diabetes for two years now. But then, you know, July was pretty good. It just sort of went away. And then it came back. You don't have moments like that with real, I wouldn't say real, but with, with strictly biologically based phenomenon, you know, diseases and, and problems like that. If you have a heart problem, it doesn't just clear up. You know, you have to have in, invasive procedures or treatments or, or something. So the fact that you're having hours, days, even months of windows, that's great. That's your brain trying to kick on and it's starting to balance itself out and it's starting to say, okay, this is how, here's the concoction. This is how it works. But the problem with brain chemistry and, and mental health is it isn't just chemistry. We put way too much on this on chemistry and that's because we're going through this benzo stuff and it, it just becomes inevitable that all we look at is you know, chemistry and neurotransmitters and GABA and, you know, damn, I mean, I, we're the smartest people in neurology. I mean, we're, we're practically specialist neurologists. So many people I talk to, they know so much about GABA and, and, and uh, the hypothalamus and parts of the brain and, you know, neurotransmitters and things like that. We become geniuses on this stuff because it's all we do. We obsess and we learn about it and, you know, Trying to figure it out like Frankenstein, trying to, well, not Frankenstein, that's probably a terrible analogy. No, anyway, you get my drift. Um, so I look at it like uh, benzos, benzo waves are a sign of hope. It's like a rainbow, you know, after, a th during a, th uh, a hurricane, you know, and, but a hurricane with many eyes, I would say, because that's what benzo is. It isn't just, you go through the wall and you, boom, you're good. And then there's a second wave and then you're good. And, you know, it's multiple waves coming at you. But, 
cherish those waves and, and use them as motivation and go, yes, I had another wave. Great. Even if it's a day, even if it's an hour and look at it and examine it and say, what, what was about this wave? What, what came before it? And, and then just like you would your, your triggers, you study it and you go, why did I have a good, what was it? And you might find some things like, you know what it was is I got my mother-in-law out of the house or, you know, I took less time at work or I started working out or that's when I started doing this hobby or, you know, I was working on this, whatever, whatever it was, you know, you make a note of it and say, okay, well, there's part of the formula for me because everyone's formula is a little different. Everyone's lifestyle and it's all different. So, uh, you know, so keep a, keep a diary on all this stuff, what your triggers are and what are, what are the things that came before the window that could be a positive thing. Uh, windows are not evidence your brain is damaged. It's evidence your brain is healing. Do we heal while tapering? Yes, we do heal while tapering. Uh, and how you can know that is if you were on, let's say, two milligrams of Ativan and you taper down to 0.5 milligrams of Ativan and you have X amount of time has passed and then suddenly I put you back on two milligrams of Ativan, it will be way too much. You, you know, it doesn't work that way. You don't come off of it and six months later you go, well, let me try two milligrams of Ativan again. And then you go, well, felt just like I did when I was on it. That's not the case. Your your neurotransmitters in your brain, your brain chemistry, it changes. It's a constantly adapting. Everything is constantly adapting in our in our brains to everything. Your your brain is adapting to my voice, to the temperature in the room, to a smell, a sound. Your it's constantly moving to the motions that you're feeling, the atmosphere of your life right now. You know, it's constantly fluctuating. So we're healing. We're healing while we're tapering. I mean, that is the, that is why it hurts, you know, unfortunately. That, that is, the, the hurt is the healing. I know it sounds crazy, but that, that is how it works. And it would be like that with any other drug addiction, alcohol, uh, uh, you know, opioids, whatever. So I know it sucks. I mean, it's not the answer you want to hear, but uh, as far as the pain part goes, the, the healing part is what you want to hear. And you need to hear that. That's why I keep doing this stuff is I want to keep beating this drum that you do heal. You do heal. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying not to cough in this mic. I still have this tick in my throat. You should do a live Q&A via YouTube. That's a pretty good idea. Um, maybe I could s set up a little camera. I'll look into that and put a little camera up on or something and do a little live Q and A. What do you guys think of that? Is that a decent idea? Would any of you want to respond and interact like that? That might be kind of, kind of interesting, huh? Uh, can you talk about the symptoms you, symptoms you've gone through? Oh boy. That, see, again, these questions are, these are big questions. I could spend 20 minutes talking about my symptoms. I mean, pull up a list and go down the list and every one of those is what I had. I mean, virtually, I don't think there was one symptom that I ever read that I didn't have at some point. Thank God I didn't deal with a super ton of akathisia or a depersonalization, derealization too, too much. I mean, I've had, you know, it's all sliding scale, you know, uh, from restlessness, adrenaline surges to pure akathisia or, you know, sleep problems to insomnia, light anxiety or, you know, moderate anxiety to panic attacks, agoraphobia. You know, it's all a sliding scale. So it's like, it's, it just fluctuates. I mean, that's all I can say. I mean, you guys going through it, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <clears throat> I've had it all. Um, that my worst symptom, I don't even know, probably was the depersonalization. That was scary as hell. The, the night terrors, you know, uh, not having sleep was dreadful. You know, waking up every, if I did sleep, I'd wake up, seem like every 15, 20, 30 minutes or to an hour with a, a nightmare. I mean, it got to the point where I didn't want to sleep. And that went on for just months and just, I mean, several, a year or something. I mean, it was, it was dreadful. But, you know, we're such creatures of adaption, excuse me, adaptation. You know, we can, we can adapt to anything. I mean, there's kids that can play and have fun in a war zone. They're just used to it. Bombs blowing up, people dying. They're just, you adapt if you grow up in it, you know? You just adapt to it. Uh, that's one sign of hope, I guess. Um, yeah, can you talk about the symptoms you've gone through? Yeah, I don't know. That I think, I don't want to dwell on symptoms. You know, like I said, I had them all. Depression, anxiety, sleep, you name it. Headaches. I remember I had a headache for like 
what felt like two years straight or something. It was, it was gnarly. Uh, vision problems, heart palpitations, uh, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to smells, flashing lights. Get out, get away, get away from me with that stuff. I can't even deal with flashing lights. I, car head, you know, headlights sometimes would pass if I was driving and it would, it would just mess me up. And I was like, whoa. Um, but as you go, you keep working, you're doing the right things, you're getting better, you're healing, you're getting less of the chemical out of your body. Okay, now you're off the chemical. Now you've got the next mountain to climb, whereas you're healing. These things just slowly keep fading off and they fall off. If I find, if we don't ruminate on them. I mean, if you're waiting every night, when is my, when is this symptom going to go away? When is this something going, symptom going to go away? You, it's like you have a self-fulfilling pro, uh, prophecy where now these things aren't going to away, going to go away. They're just going to stay. So that, that needs to be said. Um, what else? I think you're just giving people false hope. Here's some of the criticism. I've received a few of these. You're giving people false hope. How's a false hope if I'm the one I healed? How does that work? Uh, I'm an anomaly? No, I'm not. I, I can uh, Dozens of people I've known. I, I've been clients I've seen healed. You know, People get better. Um, that's a fact. And I know when you're suffering, you don't want to hear that. It's like, it's like, get the hell out of here, guy. I don't feel like I'm ever going to get better. And I've, I've seen people on forums that didn't get better, you know, 10 years later. And I can't speak for all those people. You know, I can just tell you the bulk of people, the majority of people heal. That much is, I, I promise you that. I mean, they ain't more, worth much. They need to do more research so we can just quantify this and show you, look, here studies. I'm sure there's some studies out there, more uh, newer studies emerging that we can pull from. I'll, I'll try to do some research and maybe I can put something together for you guys to, a little more scientific than Dave's word on the matter. But um, I can tell you just that, look, I'm giving you advice as a, as a benzo coach and as someone that's gone through it. Most people heal. Most people get better. It's a long, hard road out of hell and you got to work hard. That's what I'm telling you. And it takes a lot of pieces, a lot of moving pieces to get better. David Powers, Dr. Ashton says that 90 to 95% of people coming off benzos do not have pause post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Why do you not mention that? Uh, they're talking about in my book or my videos, I guess. I think you are a con artist. I know you won't respond. I was dumb enough to buy your book. It did one thing for me. Put me in a state of severe fear. Thanks. I hope you're raking in the money. <clears throat> you got to love my fans. Um, so where to start? Okay, let's start with the money. Um, there's no money, okay? I've given out more books than I've sold. Um, I continue to give out books. I just shipped over 20, 20 something, 24 books for free, okay? Um, didn't do it for the money. Don't make a lot of money on it. Maybe $30 a month or something like that on book sales. I mean, it, it, it it's nothing, guys. Um, so that's that's crazy thought right there. If you're thinking I'm raking in the cash, that's just insane. Uh, YouTube, I think, since my channel actually has gone monetized and, and I've got over 1,000 subscribers, I've made uh, $4. $4 now this year in this entire six-month span. So, yeah, I'm raking in the cash. I'm looking at getting a new maybe, I don't know, Ashton Martin nice Hollywood house up in the hills. So, you know, I just need a f just a couple more hundred subscribers and I think I'll be there. So, you know, you get stuff like this and, and people are going to be negative. They're suffering. I get it. And I also understand, look, there's a lot of people out there that are con artists and, and, uh, you know, um, so I get where you're coming from. I think there's, this is just, you know, what do you, what, what can you say about this? Um, but let me address the point. Dr. Ashton says that 90 to 90% that 5% of people come off benzos do not have pause. Well, that's what I've been saying this whole time. I say most people heal. Most people get better. That's been my entire message. If anything, this is why this is a weird comment. If anything, most of my criticism has been that I'm too positive. I'm giving false hope. Uh, you know, they're talking, they're pointing at the outliers in these um, forums and stuff as, you know, this anecdotal evidence now, or not anecdotal, as, as just plain simple evidence, you know, like, here we go, look at this, there's, you know, a thousand people in this group, and listen to their stories, well, there's a million other people that came off the drug and healed, you don't hear their stories, because they healed, and they moved on, and they don't come back and talk about it, but we can't exclude them, you know, uh, so I, that's a weird one, 95, and, and so I'm on that, I'm on board with Ashton, I'm saying, yeah, most people heal, I don't know how that makes me a con artist, that's strange, 
Um, I know you won't respond. No, that was just trying to bait me out. Well, of course, I'm going to respond and respond to virtually every message I get. I mean, it takes me sometimes a little bit because I, I have two jobs, you know, but, um, and, you know, I mean, despite raking in the cash on this stuff, insane. Uh, I was dumb enough to buy your book. It did one thing for me, put me in a state of severe fear. That part I find completely crazy too, because my book's nothing but hopeful and positive. And it tells the story about a guy that healed after coming, you know, being on a benzo for several years, almost a decade, uh, at a high dose and tapered off against, you know, uh, their doctor's orders that wanted me to stay on more benzos and put me on an SSRI and, you know, you know how it goes. I think it's a positive story. And also it's, I think the only book to date out that's written by someone that's uh, doctorally educated in clinical psychology who uh, uses, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and real techniques. I mean, everything from nutrition to exercise, exposure therapy, all kinds of stuff is packed in that book. And it's everything that worked for me, what's worked for my clients, that's worked for others. It's grounded in theory. I mean, uh, you know, it's not just another book of, here's what I went through and it was tough and, and you can do it too. That's, that's not what it was. So, um, but I'll tell you what, I, I, I don't know who this person is. You know, uh, if you want to reach out to me again, I'd happy, give, happily give you a refund on your book and, you know, sorry you feel that way. But uh, a lot of other people enjoyed the book and they got some out of it. So, okay. What else? Um, do, 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 do. This guy obviously hasn't gone through real benzo withdrawal. That's another one I love getting. Again, this is something a lot of people do where they're suffering bad and and they see someone that's healed, so therefore that person must not have suffered, you know? That person's full of it. Um, and like I said, you can't quantify that. You can't measure your suffering against other people and tell someone, you know, that their suffering isn't real because you're stronger than that person. I mean, that's just a shithead thing to do anyway. And... Um, Look, all I can say is, look, I was on it several years, about almost 10 years. I got up to 40 milligrams of Valium. I was at the time taking Vicodin for a back injury, so I was I got hooked on that crap. Um, doctor wouldn't do anything for me. I, by the time I hit the 40, I mean, nothing was working. I went to the hospital in a panic attack, heart racing in a bad state, and it was a doctor at the hospital that said, look, you're on enough Valium to tranquilize a baby elephant. That was his, his exact words. And he said, you need, to, you need to come off this. You're in bad shape here. You know, this isn't healthy for you. And that was my first real wake-up call. I was like, whoa. I went back, talked to my doctor. Well, yeah, it is a high dose. Yeah, okay, yeah, he's right. Well, let's give you Xanax. I tried Xanax, threw me into a panic attack, threw me into a really bad state. He told me just to quit taking the Valium at 40 milligrams and just wake up and take a milligram Xanax, which is r ridiculous. Uh, went into a bad state, ended up in the hospital again by ambulance. I mean, it was hell. Sunk into a severe depression. By that point, it started tapering. Took two years to taper uh, at one milligram a month. And uh, it was two years of hell. I mean, two years of hell. Um, so, and then it was about another year or two after that before I really started getting back to myself and having hope that like, oh, I think I am going to heal from, you know, completely from this. I don't think I'm going to be left in just some horrible state for the rest of my life. So I went through four years of hell, 10 years on the drug at the highest dosage that I could be prescribed. I don't know. Yeah, I guess you're right. I, I probably didn't go through real benzo withdrawal, you know. I, you know what to say? I, I do like to address the negative comments because I don't like bearing them. We all see it. We see them in the forums, in the comment section. Many of my clients, many of my clients t tell me, you know, I get attacked in these groups. I've been attacked here or there. I've had a friend attack me. I, we hear the same stuff, you know. And uh, it just, it needs to be addressed. It needs to be called out. And, and because we can correct the behavior, we can look at it and say, okay, it, maybe I'm suffering too much and I've been depressed and I'm really negative and I'm, and I'm just hurting. And I, I, maybe I lashed out at that person and that was un, undeserving because that person, you know, good for them, they healed. Or that person's trying to help people or, you know, I get it. I mean, I get it. I do get it. But uh, it's just not good behavior. And it doesn't do anything for us to be that negative. I mean, what you need to heal from this is an incredible sense of optimism and faith and positivity. I mean, all the things that are almost damn impossible to reach while you're going through it. So I do get it. I mean, I have a ton of sympathy for you guys. Believe me. I mean, not sympathy, empathy. I've been there. I get it. Uh, but being going through benzo withdrawal is not an excuse to be mean to people and be terrible to people. It just isn't. 
You know, you, we got to handle our own stuff. Uh, and, and so anyway, I do get some of these, you know, negative stuff and I'll call it out here and there just to sort of bring it to light. But over, overall, most 99% of the stuff I get the comments, the feedback that people that reach out to me are wonderful, beautiful people, thankful. I get some of the, the, the best emails anyone could ask for. I mean, people come out and say, Dave, I love you. Thank you. Your book or helped me or your videos helped me. You gave me hope. You helped me through a terrible time. I just want, you know, for what it's worth, I just want to thank you. And I mean, it almost brings me to tears every time I read that. It's like, yes, this is why I got into psychology. This is, you know, I want to help people. I want to reduce suffering on this planet any way I can. And uh, this was my fight. You know, this is where I found myself. They say, uh, you know, something to the effect of whatever wounded you is is your is now your cause. You know, what, what left a scar on you is now your cause. And and that's what it was. This is what I went through. One of the things, anyway. And so, yeah, I want to reach out to people and give them hope, tell them to hold on. I've lost friends to this. I've lost people. You know, I lost someone early this year. I'm going to do a tribute video for her. It's, it's, it's terrible, you know, and, and you never know when you're about to turn a corner. I mean, it looks so dark. It looks so dark and you think it's hopeless. And then you just never know that maybe a couple of weeks later, a month or two later, you could really turn a corner and have the life you want back. So don't give up. I mean, that's always my my message. Hold on. Let me see if I have any other um, questions worth covering here. Da, da, da. Didn't destroy my... Uh, um, mm, I'm not seeing anything. I think that's probably about it. Yeah. Do we heal while tapering? Yeah, I covered that. Um, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I think I've covered all these. I'm starting to ramble now. And people are turning off. Um, yes, if you have any comments, guys, uh, leave me some here and, uh, I will try to do another video and cover them all. And, um, I'm, and also I'm just curious to hear from you. What things do you like that I can help you with? What things do you not like? Do you want to see more of this, less of that? Um, comments, questions, whatever. Let, let me have it. All right, guys, keep strong. I got some more videos coming out soon for you guys and, uh, talk to you soon. Much love.